So hello everyone, my name is Claudia Draxel. I have the pleasure to sh share this session and welcome our speaker of today, um, Christoph Koch, um, to introduce him shortly. Um, uh, did his undergraduate studies at Heidelberg University and then he actually moved as an exchange student to Ar Arizona State University and there he actually stayed and even did his PhD about the domination of core structure, periodicity, and point defect density along these locations. So this is actually a very highly cited PhD thesis. Well, after that, in 2002, he became a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Metal Research uh, in Stuttgart. And 2011, uh, he became a full professor at Wilm University uh, before he joined 2015 the Humboldt University or the Humboldt Universität of Berlin, the Department of Physics. And since 2020, he is also the managing um, director of this um, institute. Now, um, Christoph has worked in many different uh, areas like uh, holography with electrons and photons, strain mapping, electron diffraction, dynamic inverse problems, electron tomography, grain boundaries, dislocations, Eels band gap mapping, eels, eels plasmonics, and uh, and a lot, of, a lot of other things. I think at the moment um, he's just run or started to run a brand new, uh, very fancy microscope. So I'm, uh, I think he's going to tell us about this because this produces a lot of data, and that's why uh, today's um, talk is dedicated to data science. And this context, of course, I would also like to mention that Christoph is one of the um, area leaders, one of the responsible people behind the um, uh, Fermat project uh, for making experimental science uh, fair. And yeah, with this, uh, I like to hand over to Christoph, and we're looking very much forward to your presentation. Please. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, yeah, as, as Claudia has said, I, I do have the glasses of electron microscopy on, but I try to make it more general, but use the electron microscope um, to illustrate some of the examples that, um, yeah, to give some, give some more content uh, and make it more practical than uh, what I'm trying to explain. Right, so already more than 2000 years ago, people realized that um, the world is somehow made of building blocks. And if you can understand these building blocks, you can in principle explain everything. Democritus um, at this time, he said really that the world consists of these atoms and there's nothing in between. Well, now, of course, we know there are bonds between them and so on, and they do affect each other. but. Uh, the picture hasn't really changed very much and um, actually this, this bottom line of what he said um, uh, was also reiterated then uh, about uh, 60 years ago by Richard Feynman when he said um, that all things are made of atoms in principle the same statements and um, if by some catastrophe we're losing all knowledge then this should be at least this one message that should be passed on that all things are made of atoms and he was dreaming that it should be possible to actually look at these atoms and really see what they're doing. And so there's this famous lecture that he gave in, in 1959, um, uh, where he asked, is there no way to make the electron microscope more powerful to actually then enable us to see uh, what these little guys are doing? Um, actually, and, uh, people have picked this up and uh, written papers about it. And uh, so this title I, I, I thought was quite fitting to this lecture. Um, that now actually this dream is uh, has come true. So very recently people have, and this is very challenging, um, if you're not in the field, you can probably not imagine how much work this is, but um, people have now reconstructed the three-dimensional stru three dimensional structure of uh, proteins at the atomic level so that you can really see the individual uh, bonds and carbon uh, cages and so on in these macromolecules. Um, it's been a big undertaking experimentally, but also then computationally, uh, taking uh, half a million images of, of these particles and somehow trying to put them together and reconstruct this three-dimensional structure. Um, and yeah, so this is basically where we're currently at. Um, and in material science, uh, we have the benefit that our materials can withstand 
much higher electron doses. That means we can put many more electrons into a small area on the sample um, because they're just, uh, yeah, more, less fragile. And now we can really see the atomic structure directly in principle in individual images. We don't have to take half a million and reconstruct something from these. We can really see, uh, take a picture of individual atoms and we can also then see, for example, defects here. You can see there's a defect and um, uh, that, that defect actually then also affects the properties of these materials. For example, uh, uh, diamonds, um, yeah, these are artificially grown diamonds, but they are being irradiated with, for example, electrons, but also neutrons or high energy photons to then create these, these such atomic scale defects. So a few of these defects throughout the, um, throughout the uh, uh, diamond can actually uh, change the color of the whole diamond. So you just need a few atoms behaving differently and the optical properties in this case are very different. And of course, we, we have this, um, uh, when we look at to, for example, polycrystalline materials where we have grain boundaries, uh, in principle, the properties are determined by these defects in these materials. And uh, we need to look at these and actually make connections between the properties of the material with these atomic scale um, structures that we uh, can observe. So just to give credit to um, who, who, who actually have done all the microscopy work that I will show you, um, these are the people in the group. There's a few actually heads grown. This, this is, as you can see, uh, pre-corona. So um, the group has changed a little bit, but in principle, these are the people. And um, I want to give credit to these, but I will show individual people as we go along. Uh, what we do in my group, as I said in the beginning, and, and as Claudia has introduced, we do a lot of different electromicroscopy techniques, trying to really explore the structure of materials uh, both on the atomic structure and also the electronic structure. That means how do the atoms actually um, connect to each other? What do the electrons do to bind them together with different instrumentation uh, setups? So um, Claudia mentioned already this very new microscope here. I will show some data of that. Um, actually, even newer than that is this setup here where we're now trying to really also go into very high time resolution with a uh, femtosecond um, with femtosecond electron pulses. This is currently set up, so we don't have any data. We probably won't have any data for another year, but, um, and also having, uh, for example, setups where we can really manipulate the sample inside an electron microscope. And then combining that with um, data reconstruction techniques that really require high computational power, um, or I should say modest in the context of high performance computing. We, we, we don't do that, but um, uh, we, we, we could make, actually use of it. It would actually reach, really save a lot of time. And then we also developed um, techniques in modeling experiments. And I will come to uh, why I think this is important. Uh, just the context of what this uh, is all embedded in. So here you can see uh, the Department of Physics um, that uh, I'm currently actually sitting in. Uh, across the street, there's this new building uh, called Integrated Research Institute for the Sciences in Adlershof. And you can see a bunch of labs have pooled their microscopes together here. Um, so, for example, we have from the, from the Institute for Crystal Growth, I see uh, at least one representative of that uh, in the audience here. We have then people, uh, microscopes from an, an, a large project called CatLab. It's a joint project between the Helmholtz Center uh, here in Adlershof and the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society. And then we have our own microscopes that uh, belong to Humboldt uh, University. Um, and uh, yeah. So here's the outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. So the introduction I already gave, um, what I will now uh, talk about is uh, the current state of the art in, in data collection. Again, using of course the example that I have uh, most experienced with, um, but I think this translates, at least the technology translates also to other areas in uh, material science. And then also want to really highlight the role of electronic lab notebooks and what we can do with them and how we can extend them to actually make them even more useful going beyond just taking notes. Um, and then um, I want to highlight the importance of having digital twins of your experiments that allow you to really make a connection between theory and the data that you collect because they always these experiments are always, or the data that you collect is always produced by some instrument. And that instrument must somehow be exposed to 
the theory so that you can really make that connection. I will highlight that a bit. And then uh, if you uh, uh, don't have any atomistic data that you can connect to your experiment, you can actually build it directly from the experiment going basically the other way. And uh, that's uh, one of these inverse problems that I'm very interested in. And also then even how uh, these computational tools can really even drive the experiment um, to really uh, uh, improve the experiment that you do through the techniques that um, you have available in the computer. So let's, let's focus on, on this item uh, first. Here is uh, some pictures I took of the website of Christoph um, Arbets or from the Helm, of the Helmholtz Institute um, in, in Erlangen, Nuremberg, where they really um, have gone very far in automating the synthesis and also characterization of materials. In this case, their focus is on developing, for example, photovoltaic materials based on hybrid perovskites. Um, and these machines can automatically produce new materials by spin coating them in various um, compositions and then also characterizing all their properties. And it's all driven by the computer and basically the human doesn't even have to interfere with this. It just has to um, dictate the computer now explore this range of materials. And um, actually this is quite powerful. This works actually in a setting where you really have these macroscopic tools um, and, and things that you can handle. Um, I will show you how actually we uh, can maybe potentially also apply this in the case of going to individual atoms so that to the atomic resolution, but by far not, not this automated. However, um, in the area of um, biological um, material, uh, biological structure analysis, so uh, looking at uh, the structure of proteins and reconstructing these three-dimensional structures that I've told you about, this automation is already quite far. I mean, the synthesis is not um, directly connected to the data acquisition as in the previous example I've shown you, but once you have put your sample, if you prepared it and put it in the microscope, all the data acquisition actually runs automatically. These instruments, um, they acquire these hundreds of thousands of images actually fully automated. And um, throughout, for example, whole week, the microscope can just take samples, load them automatically, um, acquire data in different areas, uh, store the data and load the next sample and so on. And then what you get at the end is um, you get images like this, you can extract them features like that, um, that uh, show you this, these proteins in different orientations. And then you can really do what I've shown you previously, uh, this full three-dimensional structure of these macromolecules down to atomic resolution. So this is quite powerful. So in certain areas, we already have this connection between um, computers and experiment and automation of experiments um, where the human is taken out of uh, the loop uh, pretty far, at least um, in, in certain stages of, of this acquisition. Then we also have uh, extremely powerful detectors nowadays. So this is just um, from one of the companies that produces detectors for electron microscopes, their, their newest product um, that now has, um, it, it can actually take it can produce images, diffraction patterns, or spectra. That means you can really look at, um, for example, chemical uh, species, you can identify them, or you can, um, if you go to very high energy resolution, also look at vibrational modes, plasma modes, and so on. I'll show none of that really, um, even though we could do that here too, but um, just to show you uh, this example um, and the huge amounts of data that these detectors produce. So for example, this has two detectors. So one is on the top here and the other one is on the back and they can be inserted um, out alternatively um, into this uh, collection system. And they produce uh, tens of gigabytes per second actually, um, if you really run them at full speed and collect all the data without doing any online processing. So this is, this is quite um, amazing. So here on our microscope, we also have one of these detectors. It's a direct detector uh, that was mounted to this microscope. Um, and uh, if, you, if you look at the, these images, you don't, you don't have the electron beam on, you don't see anything. Um, and that is actually, it's amazing. The, um, we had to wait a long time to actually make this um, happen. The, uh, waiting basically uh, for 1000 seconds, you start to see cosmic rays and these are actual events. But what's so important why I show these images is that there is no noise. So normally with these detectors, if you turn them on, you see some noise. For example, if you take your cell phone and you take a picture in a dark room, uh, it becomes very noisy. And if the, the brightness goes even further down, you see only noise. 
Um, up to now, we, actually, this was the case also with uh, detectors, for example, at electron microscopes or at synchrotrons and so on. But with this new technology, we now really can count every electron and make actually use of every electron. So this is a very important step forward in uh, really uh, going to the ultimate frontier of what uh, material science uh, can do. So um, what can we do with this, for example? I mean, one of the applications is that we uh, can move this beam across our sample um, and collect a complete diffraction pattern. So for each beam position, we can collect um, a huge amount of data and make them really full use of this data. Um, so one, uh, if, if you only integrate, uh, for example, in an annulus here um, around uh, the central spot, you see something like this is called a high angle annular dark field image. Uh, it's quite noisy, but if you then really uh, simulate the full propagation through the sample, um, you can even do this in 3D. Uh, I think I will have an example for you. Um, so we use some in principle artificial neural network structure to compare then the, the, the data that you collect um, with the one that you simulate uh, through this neural network. And then you go back and forth and refine in principle the weights in these neural networks. And that give you then the three dimensional uh, electrostatic potential within your sample. And uh, this is only a 2 dB construction, but you can see um, there's a lot more information in here. And we haven't really explored the limits of what can be done with this. So really um, the, the experimental data, the way it was done uh, centuries ago, you have data and you try to interpret it. That's one way, but we can see more and more how actually computers and automation and reconstruction algorithms find their way into material science and actually make the science um, finally um, really happening. So this was uh, in principle what, what the techniques can do. So what do we have technologically? So we have these nice instruments that can collect huge amounts of data. We have um, in some places also algorithms that allow us to do more with this data, extract more information from them. Um, but the big picture, we, we want to gain knowledge at the end um, and want to uh, extract materials knowledge from all this. So um, one, one item I want to talk about is now the role of electronic lab notebooks and how they can be expanded to really uh, make this happen. So I showed you, um, this is where data Okay, um, and now we have, uh, here we have this on an, on an atomic scale, but how do we make this connection? I mean, in material science, we're used to really uh, making these uh, connections between, well, of course, the synthesis or the processing of the material and uh, the performance that we are after at the end, but also the individual properties that um, are related to this. But this all is, of course, dictated somehow by the structure of these materials. But how do we make this, how do we make this connection? Um, and we actually need a lot of more tools to really make this happen in a broad range. There are certain islands where this is already happening and where um, we, can, we can see some of this um, already. Okay, so Fermat is this project that Claudia has already mentioned and it has, it's a very big project and it involves many labs across Germany. Um, which uh, do different things. There is one aspect of it uh, doing, uh, focusing on the synthesis of materials and it's called area A. So area B is actually focusing on different experimental techniques and developing these different tools that um, I'm going to explain to you. So one of them of course is enabling data exchange. So you can only exchange data if you talk a common language um, and uh, really developing tools that allows the conversion of different data formats into some common basis. Uh, we decided here for the Nexus format initially, but um, that's not really the focus. Uh, the focus is really developing the tools to allow you to really exchange data on a um, uh, very easily and uh, equipping everybody, also people who are not geeks in programming um, to do this. So this is one aspect of it. And another aspect of it is really to create a productive um, data sharing environment that allows you to uh, do these different things here. For example, um, do compute intensive processing of your data um, where you don't have to download software. You have access to really advanced tools that um, really uh, allow you to process data in a way that you were not able in your own lab before um, without really uh, investing into, let's say, heavy computational power and also into these codes. Um, so uh, we can really then share what is available on the market um, and to, with, with everybody. And that allows you then, if the data is processed on these servers, to really also trace all the operations and make them then uh, reproducible. 
Um, and um, uh, yeah, and, and also large data sets, actually, um, we've just experienced this last night when we tried to uh, do some demonstration of this, um, that a large data sets to transfer them is still a difficult uh, problem. And uh, this allows you to really avoid having to transfer data. One, one thing that we do, did for this was choose an open source electronic lab notebook that we were able to expand and do a number of these things with. But and some of these developments are also done um, as I will sh uh, share with you uh, in uh, the NOMAD repository. So where the data can actually be ultimately uh, deposited. So here's a workflow that I, again, I take electron microscopy as an example, but this is something that um, can be transferred to a number of different techniques. So when we prepare our samples for the electron microscope, we already start to really record all the information. And, and before, yes, you were doing this in a paper notebook, but this paper notebook, um, except for maybe a few publications that come out of this data, nobody ever looks at again. And this data is then, uh, except for the person that actually acquired the data, um, not really available. So doing this all electronically is the first step. So you record images, of course, you link it with information that you have about the material, how it was uh, synthesized and so on. And um, put this basically in, into this uh, database, whatever system you're using. Then you can take that data from the database when you do your experiment and actually link it to that and uh, use information that you have already um, uh, put into the database um, during the experiment and really uh, uh, enhancing your experiment uh, with that. And then the data, of course, ends up in, in this database again, in this electronic lab notebook that really gives you freedom to do uh, a number of things, as I will show in a second here. And then um, also doing the data analysis, you can, of course, now do this with the system that we're developing um, directly on the server where all the data is already at. So the benefit of, um, for example, not having to download large data sets um, is huge in this case. Um, and also, of course, having the available computational power and so on. Um, and this can all be done within the system now, um, giving access to the same tools to everybody, et cetera, the benefits already explained. So in, in some overview, uh, Shajir Shadbi, who has actually been very instrumental in developing, okay, um, he was very instrumental in this, um, what has, has uh, implemented this, this workflow that we have, this is this, this central hub that is this, elect, this pimped up electronic lab notebook. And I will show you in a second uh, what I mean by that. Um, so the data goes in there, you can actually access this, you can process it, and you can also upload it to some uh, public data repository. In this case, this is the Nomad database. Uh, that is basically the, the hub at the moment for uh, what the Fairmont project um, uh, stores its, its data in. But then you can also start uh, different processes in well-contained uh, containers that allow you to, for example, uh, use Jupyter Notebooks. So that means you can really do your computation on the server. You can um, have different open source tools that um, other groups uh, are contributing um, and really interact with your data. You don't even actually need to download it anymore. And that is actually very important because um, it allows you to really then also trace what is happening to the data. Many times when we process data for publications, there um, some some very non-traceable uh, sequence of operations is applied to this data until we produce this figure at the end um, that uh, is not always 100% reproducible uh, if you take all the data processing steps uh, into account. And um, this is, can all be recorded, for example, if, if you have it uh, being done online. So I just show you, this is what I wanted to actually show you. Um, um, so here, you, you, as you can see, um, this is, this is one of these experiments for this psychography experiment that I already showed you. You can really now interact with the data. You can also have electronic uh, atomic structures with it that you can compare with, um, and you can now click on these data and interact with it. And for that, um, actually, there is a, there's a little um, movie that uh, Shajir has prepared. Um, if you now click on this, you can, for example, load different Jupyter notebooks. You can interact with the data on the server directly. And you can see all the different data sets. You can uh, work on these as if you would be on your own computer, except now you have really access to high computational power um, uh, and also uh, these large data sets um, that uh, can be processed directly there. And you can change the code, you can rerun it, and so on. Um, I, I will skip some of this um, in, in, in interest of time. 
um, because uh, I want to move on. If you have any questions, uh, just uh, send me or Shajil or the other people that are involved in this. Let me focus on something I didn't mention. There really is now a team that uh, works actually on really uh, expanding these capabilities and making them available also um, with, to data that is uploaded to the Nomad database that consists of Markus Scheibken, Shajil Shabi, uh, Shandor Brockhauser, and also Markus Kübach and uh, probably also other people uh, within the Fairmont project uh, um, that are contributing to this. If you look at these modern instruments, um, this is, an ex for example, the, the microscope that uh, Claudia has mentioned initially. You can see there are these different modules, and each of these modules is actually quite complex inside. Uh, some of these bigger modules, they have a few hundred different uh, uh, power supplies or different currents that can be controlled to actually steer the electron beam. So these are extremely complex machines. Um, and what is happening on the way, so the source of the electrons is down here. Um, it goes then to here, goes through the sample and ends up on the detector, passing all these different electron optical elements uh, in order to really um, make a connection between the atomic structure and the electronic structure of the material that you put into your microscope with the data that is actually being collected at the end, you need to have a digital twin of this instrument in order to really um, simulate the whole process and really connect directly uh, your theoretical model with the data. Because actually this is the best way of doing it. The data obeys some counting statistics, Poisson statistics, and um, all these comparisons, chi-squared methods and so on of data with simulations, they in principle uh, assume all these statistical properties. And if you want to do it correctly, you have to go into, um, these, uh, into the space of the detector itself. So that means you should actually go through the instrument and do this properly. Um, here is a simplification of this instrument. So just the scattering process already of the electrons within the material is already quite complex. Um, and it can produce these beautiful images. And you can see here, and there's one electron beam drawn through this material, and there's a huge amount of data that you can uh, record from this. And the question is, can we make full use of this data? Because um, here's an example. This is uh, some data that was collected by a group in Japan, by Kenji Tsuda uh, and his colleagues. And Robert Pennington, who used to be in my group, he uh, tried to then analyze this data. And so by putting the electron beam into different positions, for example, here A, B, or C, you get these different diffraction patterns. Um, they seem to look all very similar, but there are slight differences. And actually these differences, they depend on the polarization of this material, which changes here on a nanometer scale. And if this, the sample is roughly 30 nanometers thick, it also changes in the Z direction. So it really, there is, um, there is a lot going on. And actually, if you don't have any process that uh, does this complete simulation and compares this with the experimental data at the end, um, it's difficult. You can only make course approximations to the interpretation uh, that you should be doing. And so what he did is he then actually did the propagation of the electron beams through here, changed the atoms, recalculated the distribution of electrons using uh, density functional theory. So this is already a first step where you can see um, these digital twins, they don't only consider, um, I don't know, magnetic and electric fields to control electrons, but you also have to include theory in the loop in order to really make full use of all the computational tools that uh, we have available to interpret the data at the end. And he was able to really show that you can uh, get a three-dimensional reconstruction of, of these uh, polarizations. In, in the Z direction. Here's another example of spectra that have been recorded in this case by Alberto Alfarat on this uh, microscope where we have a very high energy resolution where you can really see um, this is the, this is this green curve here is the raw spectrum. And if you really want to see the direct electron, uh, the direct band gap of this material of silicon, which should be at 1.1 eV roughly, um, you really have to do a lot of processing of this data. And so actually, again, this is some computational uh, a computationally expensive process that involves GPUs and so on uh, to really uh, make it uh, in some reasonable amount of time uh, to reconstruct the uh, electron loss function from this data. And if you then compare it to uh, database information, so extracting optical data from a database, um, this uh, does not quite uh, match as you can see, even though some of these important features are there. But um, then taking more information from a database, in this case, 
for silicon dioxide that you have assume is at the bottom and at the top of the material, and then redoing this process of scattering through the material. Again, um, this is the role of a digital twin. You have to really uh, model this propagation of the electron beam throughout your material to really then uh, extract the dielectric function of the, uh, in this case, simple silicon um, that you want to see uh, and, and compare it into reference data and it, uh, make sure that it actually compares well. In this case, we knew what uh, should we, we, we should expect um, because silicon is a very well understood uh, material. Um, if you look at something uh, more exotic, for example, this is barium stanate, um, which uh, Alberto has also recorded data of, then he applied the whole process. So this iterative reconstruction, removing all the relativistic effects and so on to obtain this pink, um, this, uh, pink data here. So this was then reconstructing the dielectric function. And then Claudia Axel um, and her group, they have done uh, some uh, DFT calculations to show, oh, it doesn't quite agree. And then they actually used the more advanced um, code, the exciting code to solve the beta side beta equation. Uh, and that compares uh, much, much better with the experiment. Now you can see this is the black curve, it's a theory, um, the beta side beta theory, and the experiment is the pink curve, and they can come to very good agreement. So this is when you have information about the theory and experiment all in the same place. And this is what actually the role of Fermat, uh, that, that's the role that Fermat wants to play to bring all these different techniques, um, theoretical and experimental together to really uh, help us gain uh, knowledge of uh, materials. And you also, in addition uh, from the experiment, you can also extract the real part of this dielectric function that of course gives it an additional information in addition to the, the, the losses. Um, I don't have much more time, but I will, uh, don't have many more slides either. So um, just quickly, uh, if we don't have any theory available, we can also go the other way around. We can actually, from the experiment, provide um, atomistic data that can be fed into the database of atomic structures, and then can, of course, hopefully be verified by some theory as well. So here's actually um, a few bachelor and master theses uh, in my group have focused on this project. Um, this is an image of an amorphous material. So in principle, when I grew up learning electron microscopy, um, um, I learned basically there is no information in here. You cannot extract anything from this. This is basically a speckle pattern. That's the only information you get from that. Um, and you know that it's not crystalline but amorphous. But actually, if you this is a quantitative reconstruction of the electrostatic potential of an amorphous material. So this is data that we can actually rely on. Um, uh, it was recorded of a metallic glass containing zirconium and copper and um, yttrium. And now basically these students have been able to really reconstruct an, a three-dimensional atomistic model from these two-dimensional images of glass. Of course, then again, here theory has to play a role and um, we use some compressed sensing that allows us to um, really uh, minimize the number of different uh, local structures or local environment of atoms in the structure um, and use that as a constraint, which is uh, physically very reasonable and uh, basically then get images that we simulate from this that actually match the experiment um, very well. And uh, with that, we can really uh, extract information about even amorphous materials where, for example, density functional theory um, uh, cannot handle, uh, in many cases, the number of atoms, but it can handle potentially then these calculating these local atomic clusters that we extract from this, and they can then again be compared to theory, because this is the information that we're after at the end. I won't, won't get into detail here, just to sell, tell you that that was the aim to extract these local atomistic clusters from amorphous materials uh, that can then help to uh, connect to theory again. Maybe one last thing, um, I explained how we can go, uh, how theory can help to interpret experimental data, how experimental data can help to actually um, somehow populate the database of atomistic structures that um, can then be compared to theory. And uh, a third operation, how computers and experiment can be connected is that actually the theory controls the experiment. So um, this is a project uh, by uh, Marcel Schloss, um, who uh, is doing his uh, doctoral uh, work in, in my group. 
And he actually is the one who has invested a lot into the reconstruction algorithm that reconstructs these high fidelity images from these large amounts of scattering data that I've uh, showed you initially. Um, and the, one of these problems of electron microscopy is we can really uh, see individual atoms, but when you can see individual atoms, you also need to shine a lot of electrons on these individual atoms. And the chances are that you actually either kick them out or you destroy bonds or so. So there's always the aim uh, within our field to reduce the dose. That means the number of electrons per area. And um, the question was, can we actually do that? Can we use the computational tools that we have available to drive our experiment to not use as many electrons or to actually be more conservative with the number of electrons? And um, so we decided, oh, can we do a factor of 40 less than we would normally do? And um, there is this principle called, called compressed sensing, um, where uh, in principle, you assume that your image um, is sparse in some basis that uh, you can represent it in. And you don't need to collect all the information. You, in principle, only need to collect the part of the information. And that part um, can then uh, help to reconstruct the complete data set. And so, but uh, often, I mean, this factor of 40 is actually quite challenging for that. And if you try that, you, you choose random positions. You position your beam uh, randomly through here, but uh, the factor of 40 less beam positions uh, the reconstruction that you get from that does not look very good. But of course, then um, having pre-trained an artificial neural network with different atomistic structures that um, are related to this material that he investigates, um, uh, he was then able to train an, uh, a re uh, reinforcement learning scheme um, to really optimize the beam positions. So now uh, this uh, basically it starts with these random positions. And once it has a reconstruction of these random positions, it then can predict where should the beam um, optimally be placed to actually have a more effective data collection. And basically going in slices, and, and you can see here by color, it's indicated in five different slices, actually the, the positioning of the electron beam improves more and more. And actually at the end, you can really recover the atomistic structure using a factor of 40 uh, less beam positions and also electrons. Anyway, I hope uh, with all that, I was able to show you that really modern scientific instruments are capable of delivering a huge amount of very high quality data. So now we can really, in this field of electron microscopy, we can really count every electron and um, you can't go any better than that. Um, we're making full use of the information we have available. Um, the question is, how can we actually make use of this information in the context of learning more about material science? And, um, and that is what actually we're now uh, working on developing. So we can accelerate the materials development by linking um, these different uh, material synthesis protocols materials properties that we measure from materials that have been synthesized with the atomic structure information on a very local basis. Um, as I said, I mean, individual defects can really control materials properties. And of course, uh, we shouldn't miss then theoretical. I mean, this is ab initio theory, but could also be a molecular dynamics and so on uh, with maybe force fields uh, determined by ab initio and whatever or the experiment. And for that, we need computational tools that integrate all these different types of data, uh, which is not straightforward and has only been done in very uh, small island solutions. And we're really aiming to do this on a larger scale. We need to um, digitize and automate the data collection. I mean, I didn't go into this, but some of this data collection um, uh, that uh, we're doing is now already uh, fully automated where all the metadata is acquired automatically and then automatically also exported to these electronic lab notebooks. Um, and of course, we need to have these digital twins that allow us to really make solid connections between uh, theory and the experimental data, really the data that we're after, not the interpretation of it at the end. And Fermat is focusing on all these different aspects of this material cycle um, uh, where we hope to really accelerate the development of materials. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, for this very beautiful lab tour. Uh, so raise your hand or, or write a question to the chat and then we will... Uh, yeah, so we have one question by Markus Wolgarten. Yes. Um, thank you, Christoph. Very nice talk. Um, actually, I have two questions. Um, 
quite exciting, these results from these amorphous materials. Um, how unique are the solutions you get out of the reconstruction? This is my first question. And the other one concerns the, the last example you showed with this optimized scanning scheme. Um, does this also work if you have defects in your um, graphene or whatever 2D material? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in this case, it was MOS2, but um, maybe to answer the second question, yes, it also works with defects. Um, the, the, I didn't go into the detail of this. There's actually a paper that is hopefully being submitted soon. Um, but uh, yes, so this network has to be pre-trained with a large number of structures in order to be quite flexible. Um, and then um, when there's a defect, it actually optimizes the beam position um, to really, really, well, find information that would be missed otherwise. So that is this optimization of data acquisition where you can really uh, go in deeper if, uh, if there's information missing. Um, maybe this much, I would have to go really into a long talk to explain the really, all the details of this. Um, to answer the first question, amorphous structures, the aim is not to really um, position every atom in, in 3D space because this information is quite useless in principle. What you're ultimately after is structural units. So three-dimensional atomic arrangements um, and units that make up this amorphous material. Um, and well, we haven't explored completely the, the, the uniqueness of these structural units, but uh, the basis is of course much smaller than the basis of all the atoms in this three-dimensional volume, right? Um, so we're actually quite confident that we can find these uh, also quite uniquely. Yeah. Thank you. Then I have a question by Thomas. Hey, thanks, Christoph, for a great talk. Um, this uh, ability to launch Jupyter Notebooks from eLab, this is really a killer feature. I'm just wondering about your Docker containers. Um, do you have one container that you share with standard code or every user has their own container? How do you do this? Actually, these are details that I should refer to Shajil and in the new solution that uh, actually goes with also the Nomad um, uh, Oasis uh, solution. Um, that then other people are involved that I mentioned. But in principle, you, you, you have, I, I know that much that you always launch new containers. So uh, there's not one container that everybody shares, but no, there are new containers that see only the data that is connected with that data set. So I, I think I, the video showed it quickly that only the data that is within this experiment can actually be seen within that container. And then also the code has to live in that container. So you can even upload your own codes um, and run them in there. And there is basically, uh, it's fully separated from all the other data sets and of course also the system that it runs on. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question by Luca Tiangeli. Yeah, thanks uh, for the talk. Of course, I, I have a question about compressed sensing and it is, um, my, my question is, if um, it was explored whether there is a, a kind of theoretical minimum of number of observations that one can do, for example, using some synthetic uh, uh, so simulated uh, uh, electron uh, microscopy ima images, and uh, uh, so that one has a, a theoretical minimum of, of number of observations that one should do, and whether it is, for example, uh, uh, correlated with the symmetry of the, of the crystal. So it is this number. Yeah, that, that, that's your work, right? Uh, well, I, I know compressed sensing, but in a completely different uh, scenario. So that, that's yeah. why I was asking this. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, so was that your question already, or? Yeah, the question is really if there is a theoretical mean, also if it, ah. it was explored with, uh, for, because in, in the, uh, so real images, you might have some noise or some, some artifacts, but uh, if you have uh, looked into uh, the, say, theoretical uh, um, reconstructed image and, and you can uh, uh, assess whether there is a, a, a minimum number of observation. So the sparsity is, is defined by the complexity of the image to be short. I, I see uh, your point. Actually, um, this, this, this depends of course a lot 
of course, also on the data quality, right? Mm -hmm. um, if your if your uh, observation has high fidelity, that means high signal to noise, um, and you only make a few of these, I think you can make uh, more inferences. But um, to be honest, I, I know compress sensing, of course, has these uh, has these uh, certain limits, but um, I'm forgetting this uh, indicator that you need to know right now. That really depends also a lot on the data. So I would say it's not as easy. At least I, nobody has explored this so far. We yeah. definitely haven't, and I haven't seen it anywhere else. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, then I see a hand up, uh, mad up, Jalali. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, you know, it's uh, my question is very general question. Sorry for that. Uh, you know, in the, some area of the material science, once we predict some material property with the machine learning instead of doing it in the lab, uh, the material scientists cannot rely on the result even we evaluate them with the proper parameters. Uh, so, for example, with some time story prediction like the deep learning or LSTM, we predict tensile stress for the tensile test data. And uh, uh, I still have a um, problem to deal with the, uh, these things. How we can make them sure that uh, rely on our result, uh, always uh, we have uh, some problem with that. Yeah, so I think in general, of course, yes, um, the, the theoretical model that you have to interpret your data, if that is somehow flawed, then um, your interpretation of the data is wrong, right? Yeah. Um, and especially when you now try to use machine learning, um, it actually becomes like a black box. You don't really know what is happening uh, in, in, in the background uh, within this box. So, but data scientists have actually developed some tools to really explore the reliability of these, for example, artificial neural networks. Um, and other machine learning techniques, um, whether they just um, have an over, uh, they overinterpret your data um, or they really um, have uh, some reliability in it to make predictions that are reliable. So you can, that, that's the first step to really look into um, if you use machine learning. And of course, the other um, thing is there are also machine learning tools that use physics to extend the, their capabilities to really have the physics or some fundamental physical processes built into the uh, interpretation. And then you don't need to go all the way. So right now, if you have a theoretical model that explains, for example, I think you mentioned strain uh, data, um, then this model has to explain the complete data in order to really interpret it. But if you combine it, uh, these fundamental physical principles with the machine learning, you don't have <laughs> You can somehow rely on the computer somehow bridging some of the gaps that your model would not um, be capable of, right? Of course, if you have a, a complex relationship between theory and your observation, um, it's difficult to really make this model, model complete. But if you can build in some fundamental physical properties and let the computer, um, for example, the neural network, uh, train the remaining uncertainties you can actually go a lot further. So there is a lot of literature on actually these um, hybrid tools that um, have embedded physical properties already in their, in their capability to train uh, uh, data. Mm, thanks. Okay, so I don't see a further question. So let me thank uh, Christoph again for this beautiful talk. Everyone for, uh, yeah, who has contributed to discussion, everyone being here. And we will keep you informed about the next in event. So the, those that are planned for the next month will hopefully take place uh, in person. Uh, but anyway, look up our webpage. We will also inform you through our emails. And yeah, thanks for being here and see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.